announce our upcoming Christmas party. Now, I know we haven't even celebrated Thanksgiving yet, but we are having our party a little bit earlier this year and we wanted to give you plenty of time to prepare and plan to be there. So, this year, our Christmas party is a favorite things Christmas party and it's going to be on Thursday, December 3rd from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We will be providing soups, sides, desserts, and all the things to go with it. All you will need to bring is yourself and your favorite things. So you may be thinking like, why, what, favorite things? I don't understand. So we are having a favorite things Christmas party this year. And what that means is we want you to pick one item that means something to you. It could be a kitchen gadget, it could be hand lotion, it could be nail polish, it could be a warm cozy blanket, whatever it may be, but the catch is you need to bring two of that item and the, per item it needs to be six to seven dollars or under. I would make the decision to bring two coffee cups. These are bought from the store. I'm not bringing my actual favorite coffee cup because that's just like, no. But I'm buying something brand new that's six dollars or under and two of that item. Now they are two different prints, but they are two of the exact same item. And then once we are there and we do this activity, we will be prepared to share why we picked that item and what it means to us. We are so looking forward to it. Last year we had girls, ladies of all ages, and I'm just so excited to see you all there. Join us as we worship this morning. All right, we serve an awesome God. We want to lift his name high, so join us as we sing. firm foundation our rock the only solid ground the nations rise and fall kingdoms once strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of jesus we trust the name of jesus You are the only king forever. 
justice you will reign and every knee will bow we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of jesus sing it out we trust
praise Him when your heart is breaking, when your strength is almost gone. Sing out your song and praise Him in the fire and fury. In the dark night of your soul, your God is in control. Your tears will dry, your heart will mend, your scars will heal, and you will dance again. Tears will dry, your heart will mend, your scars will heal, and you will dance again. Praise Him, tell your
Hey, what's up, church? Thanks for joining us today. My name is Chris Sykes. I get to be one of the pastors here at the church at Lake Forest. Listen, if this is the first time that you're joining us online, make sure you take out your phone and text the word GUEST to 662-709-6849. We would love to know that you are joining us, that you've become a part of our church, uh, that you would like to connect. So when you text the word GUEST to 662-709-6849, you're gonna get a response. Uh, it'll be a little link, uh, click on that link, and then, of course, at that point, let us know your name and, and the other things that it asks for. We are a church for our neighbors and the next generation, and we are a church where no perfect people are allowed. We would love for you to come join us in person uh, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., but if you can only join us online, then that's great. We're glad that you're watching online. Now, we are in the third week of a series that I've uh, sort of playfully titled worst year ever because so many of us uh, have experienced man just some crazy things in 2020 this may not be your worst year ever but every year is somebody's worst year ever and so what we're doing really is we're taking uh, a look at some horrible circumstances that are described in the bible and then we're looking at the the responses of the people or the responses of god in the midst of those circumstances. And really what we're doing is we're not lamenting uh, the problems, the circumstances, what, you know, what, what makes it the worst year ever. Instead, we are discovering the grace of God in His Word. And so last week we looked at Job 1 and 2. I would encourage you to go back and watch, uh, you know, watch that message if you, if you missed that. But we started taking a look at the sovereignty of God because I believe wholeheartedly that you cannot completely grasp the grace of God unless you understand the sovereignty of God. And so we, we started that last week, and we're basically going to continue that this week, and we're going to finish up uh, just, a, I mean, just a really short overview of the book of Job. But uh, just to sort of remind you what's going on, I mean, Job, without a doubt, is having his worst year ever. Now, Job's a really good guy. Job is described as being uh, blameless, as being upright. And if you'll remember last week, I taught you that you know righteousness is sort of our our uh, vertical relationship to God. If if you are a completely righteous person, then you would have this you know perfectly sinless relationship with God. It's it's vertical. The Bible teaches us that there's no one righteous, no, not one, that none of us are perfect, that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. So even Job would have sinned, but the Bible describes him as being blameless. Blameless is, is really more of the, the horizontal relationship that we have with other people in our righteousness, our blamelessness to the world around us. And so Job is one of these guys who tries to do everything right. I mean, people, people like Job. Um, people uh, probably even envy Job in, in many ways. I mean, he's, he's a wealthy man. The Bible describes him as being the wealthiest and, and, and probably the most powerful person in the region when he's alive. Um, he honors God. He, he offers sacrifices even for uh, his kids, like just in case. It's his habit to worship God in the midst of his prosperity his, his, his wealth and his prosperity actually drive him closer to God instead of farther away from God, as is so often the case today. And so we saw last week in Job 1 and 2 that Satan comes to God and God says, Have you considered my servant Job? That, that God really honors Job by raising him to this level of, of, of being worthy of consideration. And so as a result in Job 1 and then in Job 2, uh, Satan um, really just sort of turns his fury against Job, and Job loses everything. All of his children die. All of his 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 uh, uh, servants die. All of his uh, livestock die. I mean, he loses everything really, but his his wife, and then he even loses his health in Job chapter two. That he's covered with with boils from from head to toe. And what we discovered last week is that God's purpose in all of this is not to punish Job for his sinfulness, but God's purpose in all of this 
<clears throat> is actually to use Job, and God uses us when He considers us, but He uses Job to prove that Satan is, is wrong. Job becomes the evidence. We, as Christians, we become the evidence that Satan is just wrong and that God is who He says that He is. And so this week, we're really going to take a look at the end of Job, Job chapter 42. We're going to kind of see the response at the end of all of this from Job. But I want to just kind of summarize some things. And let me remind you that, that here's what Job is going through. I mean, like this is the, the craziest, worst year. And, and by year, I mean like year. This is, this is really almost a year for Job. It's months and months of his life where he has been suffering. And quite frankly, I actually... I. There's nothing scripturally to, to prove this, but I happen to believe that uh, Job might have gone about a year um, from the death of his children until his sickness actually sets in, or at the very least, at least a year from Job chapter 2 to, verb ch to Job uh, chapter 42, the end of Job. And here's the reason why. How difficult is it for people when they lose a loved one, a spouse, a child, uh, a parent? How difficult is it when you begin to celebrate those anniversaries and those birthdays, the first Christmas, the first Thanksgiving, the first birthday, the first anniversary, without someone, without a loved one in your life? So in the midst of that kind of anguish, as Satan attacks the body of Job, here's some things that Job has had to deal with. Intense pain. It says in Job 30, 17, My bones are pierced in me at night, and my gnawing pains take no rest. His skin is peeling, and it's darkened. My skin grows black and falls from me. Job 30, 30. Job 7, 5 says, My flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. He has these pus-filled, erupting sores. I mean, Job is miserable. He's probably suffering from emaciation, maybe even anorexia. It says, My bones cling to my skin and to my flesh in Job 19.20. My bones burn with fever. It says in Job 30.30, 30, he's, he's feverish. He's suffering. He's probably going, and no doubt, going through depression. I loathe my life. I would not live forever, Job 7, 16. And my heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I go about mourning, but not in the sun, Job 30, 27 and 28. My face is flushed with weeping, Job 16, 16. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be ended, Job 7, 4. It's, he, he's enduring sleepless nights, sleep deprivation. He's having nightmares. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, Job 7, 14. My breath is offensive to my wife, Job 19, 17. He's, like his, his flesh is so rotten that even his breath is putrid. He has difficulty breathing. Uh, his teeth are rotting. His vision is failing. He has painful swollen sores all over his body. He's experiencing int intense itching. And then in Job 7, 3, it says, Oh, that I were as in months past, and I have allotted months of futility. That's uh, Job 29, 2 and Job 7, 3. This condition lasted for months and months. This is the worst year, possibly the worst years ever for Job. And then as we read last week at the end of chapter 2, three of his friends show up. And for the next 35 chapters, these friends, quite frankly, uh, they almost become bitter enemies. Because for 35 chapters, they go back and forth with Job, debating the character of God and Job's responsibility and his culpability, his sinfulness in his own suffering. Even though Job says that he has not sinned in the eyes of God, these, these friends are convinced that he must have. At times, it gets pretty contentious uh, to the point that you, that you might even wonder, will they still be friends when this is all over? But just when it seems that there's no 
theological answer, no theological agreement for Job's suffering, something amazing happens. God speaks to Job from a whirlwind. It says in Job 38, 1-3, The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man. I love that. Put your big girl pants on, Job. Come on. Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. You see, what Job has done leading up to this is he's he's decided, I mean, and, and remember, like Job is going through the worst experience probably any man has ever faced. And in the midst of all that, as much as Job loves God and has worshiped God and honors God, he's hurting so bad, he's begun to ask God why, and he comes to the point where he actually challenges God, and he he wants God to, to show up and answer his questions. Well, Job has no control and authority over God, but God chooses in his sovereignty to show up. And he actually says back to Job, Hey, Job, put your big girl pants on. you got some questions to answer for me because I'm God and you are not. And so for the next four chapters, God takes Job on a whirlwind tour of all of creation. Maybe not all of creation, but a, a big chunk of creation. And he challenges Job's knowledge and his wisdom and his power and his authority. Because here's the thing about Job. In his suffering, Job had forgotten who God was and who Job was in relationship to God. He had forgotten, Job had forgotten, that God was greater than Job. See, a lot of times in our suffering and the calamity and the tragedy that we we face and we, we struggle with, And we say, God, why? The questioning is okay, but then we begin to accuse God like Job accused God. Maybe there is no justice. Maybe God doesn't really care. Maybe God doesn't really love me. And when we do that, what we're actually saying is, we know better than God. We could do this better than God if we were in control. And what we forget, like Job forgot, is that God is greater. God is greater than Job. God is all-powerful. God is is full of knowledge, full of wisdom. He has the authority to do whatever he wants to do. God is so much greater than us that even though his actions are right, even though his that 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 to us they don't seem right, his actions are right. God is, God is so much greater than us that his actions may be right even when they are not apparently right to us, just like they weren't apparently right to Job and to his friends. Job wondered, God, did you get it wrong? But there is no one else with God's power and knowledge and authority and wisdom. In fact, in Job 40, verses 8 through 14, God says this to Job, Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like this? All right, Job, put on your glory and splendor, your honor and majesty. Verse 11, give vent to your anger. Let it over overflow against the proud, humiliate the proud with a glance, walk on the wicked where they stand, bury them in the dust, imprison them in the world of the dead, Job. Then even I, God, would praise you, Job, for your own strength would save you. See, what God is saying to Job is, Job, listen, if you know it all, right? I mean, you know, if if you know it all and you can do it all and you have all power and all authority, then go right ahead. If you think you can run this world better than I can, then be my guest. As a matter of fact, if you can do that, then I would bow down to you because you would have the power to save yourself. Clearly, that is not true. Clearly, God would never bow down to anyone else because He's God and we're not. But isn't isn't that really kind of like what every superhero story is about? Every, every superhero movie that you've ever watched, 
right? Isn't that what it's all about? Somebody having the strength to save themselves and humanity going along with them. I mean, that's, that's who we aspire to be many times, to be strong enough to save ourselves. But the reality is we are not. And then finally in Job 41, 11, God gives us a great summary of what He is trying to teach Job. And it's this. He says, Who has given me anything that I need to pay back? Everything under heaven is mine. See, God is clearly stating His authority, His power, His knowledge, His wisdom, His sovereignty. He doesn't owe anybody anything least of all Job. And all authority, everything under heaven belongs to God. God in His mercy and His graciousness chose to reveal Himself to Job. Listen, today, as we read God's Scripture, God's Holy Word that He gave to mankind, God has chosen to reveal Himself to you today. God has chosen to reveal Himself to to me, to us as a church, to, to the United States of America, to the world. God has chosen to reveal Himself in His graciousness through the Word of God. He doesn't owe us that. But he gives us that. That's a, that's a part of his grace. Job could not command it. He could not demand it. And we cannot either. And God, God does it. God, God reveals himself to us. And he reveals himself to Job while Job is still in his sin. Remember, Job is covered in sores. He's, he's actually sinning before God, by not by asking God questions, but by accusing God of not loving Him, by accusing God of not acting with justice. And even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows us His grace by simply revealing Himself, revealing His purposes, revealing His love. By sending His Son to this world to seek and to save those who are lost, God is showing us His amazing grace and He shows mercy ultimately on Job. And so what I want to focus on this week is Job chapter 42, the end of the story. Because in this chapter, we see God reverse the curse. We see God reverse the curse. This is when God turns it all around for Job. This is Job's turnaround story, his comeback story. Do you need a turnaround today? Uh, if you, I, want you to, I want you to get this. Job doesn't turn himself around. God does. right? In his sovereignty, God turns everything around for Job. A lot of times, again, we want to be the hero of our own story. We want to turn ourselves around. And listen, I know a lot of great people with a lot of great comeback stories, with amazing turnaround stories. But what I want you to understand is that as hard as it may have been for them to turn their lives around, as much work and as much effort as they put into it, and I don't want to discount that at all, but in the end, God is the one putting the breath in their lungs. God is the one putting the power in their limbs. God is the one giving them the fortitude in their faith and and the knowledge and and the, the willpower that's a part of their lives to turn themselves around. So ultimately, every turnaround comes from God in His sovereignty, in His grace, and in His mercy. So if you're in a place in your life where you need a turnaround, I want you to understand that the whole point of the book of Job is this. God invites us to trust Him to reverse the curse. God invites us to trust Him to reverse the curse. Remember Job in chapter 1 and 2, he's blameless and upright. He's a really good guy. He's, He's a guy that everybody wants to be around. He did everything right. Job did everything right, but everything went wrong for him. 
more than likely if you're watching this message, you are that kind of a person. You're the kind of person who's tried to do everything right. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, just like it doesn't mean that Job was perfect, and it doesn't mean that you've never made a mistake, but you've at least tried to do the right thing. Maybe your whole life, but at least right now, you're trying to get it right. You're trying to do the right thing. You've probably given your life to Christ, which is the right thing. You are part of the church. That's the right thing to do. You probably tried to learn something in school. You even, you know, you 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 studied hard. You you studied for your test. Um, you may have even thought long and hard about going to the right college, getting the right degree, so that you could get the right job and have the right career. You even did your best to marry the right person. And right now, you're trying to honor that marriage, and, and you're doing your best to raise your kids in the fear and admonition of God, and you're, you're doing the right thing by raising your kids right. You're not a dropout. You're not a quitter. You're not a cheater. You're not a deadbeat. You're a great guy. You're a great woman. You try to do the right thing. You go to work. You pay your taxes. You try not to manipulate and take advantage of people. You honor your boss. You do what you're supposed to do, at least most of the time. You do your best to do everything right. But if truth be told, the reality for all of us is that many things in our lives go wrong. And sometimes they go horribly wrong. The reality is, if we're honest, we've all had issues in our relationships. We've had fractures in our friendships. And right now, we may even have sickness invading our homes. It's at least trying to. Whatever you are going through, you probably need a change. If you're in the midst of tragedy and calamity, you definitely need a change. Job recognized this. In Job 14.14, 14, uh, it says this, or Job says this, all the days of my struggle, that word struggle there, it could be translated warfare, like, like life is a battle, right? It's a battlefield. And so Job says, all the days of this, of this battle of life, I will wait until my change comes. All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes comes. With all of his ups and downs, Job knew that true change comes not from within himself, but from God. He's waiting for his change to come to him. In fact, in Job 19.25, we get the clearest indication of faith anywhere uh, uttered in the Old Testament. And Job says this, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. While Job may have, may have questioned God's reasoning, ultimately he trusted God's redemption story. I know that my Redeemer lives. That word, that, that phrase there, that, that word Redeemer is goel. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's the kinsman Redeemer. This is, this is uh, Job sees this as someone related to him. Uh, not a family member, no, but, but someone that he has a personal relationship with, Jesus. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. That word lives in the Hebrew, the, the tense of that verb, basically means it's something that has always been, is right now, and will always continue to be. Job is saying, I know that my Redeemer has always lived. He is alive right now, and He will always continue to be. Job is declaring, without even knowing who Jesus is or knowing the name of Jesus, he's declaring his faith and his goel and his Redeemer. That is a faith, it is a relationship, it is a Redeemer for yesterday, today, and forever, for all time. And ultimately, Job trusted God's redemption story. And he even said that one day, one day, he will stand upon the earth at last. Job looked forward to the future when Jesus is going to come. And listen, we're waiting for a change. One day, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to set foot 
on earth again and change everything. There's one thing that we believe strongly at the church at Lake Forest that I believe strongly, and that is Jesus changes everything. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, He changes everything. Everything. If you don't hear anything else that I that I that I teach you about this morning from Job chapter forty two, which we we still haven't even gotten to yet, but if you don't if you don't hear anything else, know this: Jesus changes everything. If you need change in your life, like Job, trust the Redeemer. Trust in Jesus Christ. God is inviting you to trust in His redemption plan and His redemption story. He's inviting you to trust Him in His sovereignty, that He knows what's best. God is inviting you to trust Him today. So, let's see how this massive life change goes down for Job. Job 42, verses 1-6 through six, say this, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. God, you said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. God, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes, to show my repentance. Listen, the, one of the biggest things that Job realizes here uh, throughout this whole passage, this whole story, is that you can't put God in a box. You cannot put God in a box. And God has revealed Himself and revealed His majesty and His sovereignty in such a way that, that it causes Job to, to confirm what was right about his theology, and throw everything away that, that didn't match who God actually was. And so I, wanna, I want you to notice a, a few things in Job chapter 42. And so the first thing in this section is, number one, Job responded to God's revelation and recognized God's sovereignty. Job responded to God's revelation and, and recognized God's sovereignty. So in these previous few chapters, God revealed Himself. That's, that's the revelation of God. The first thing that Job does is he, he recognizes two imp important truths about God. He recognizes that God can do anything and that God knows everything. God can do anything and God knows everything. Listen, that's the sovereignty of God. Job recognized, he recognized the sovereignty of of God in his life as it was revealed to him. And so Job uh, sort of goes back through all of these accusations that he's made against God and he apologizes for those. But what he what what we have to realize is that it's okay to question God, right? When Job asks questions, when we ask questions, it's okay for us to question God. But our motivation behind those questions reveal where, where our hearts are. It's our motivations that really are far more important than, than our questions, at least to God. The questions are important to us. The motivation is important to God. Job said earlier, if I could find God, I have some questions for Him, right? If I could find God, if I could just get God to show up here, I, I'm going to give Him a piece of my mind. That's kind of the, 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 the gist of the motive behind Job's questions, and that was a poor, sinful motive. But here's how I know that questions are not all that bad. Even Jesus questioned God as He's hanging on the cross in the midst of suffering very similar to Job's. Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But see, Jesus' motivation was not the same as Job's motivation. Job's motivation was sinful. Job's motivation was, was, to, was to kind of put God in his place. But Jesus' motivation was not that at all. His motivation was, was pure and humble. Not to point out God's mistake, but to put himself in proper position to the authority of God. <clears throat> so... If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. 
While you are waiting for a change, while you are waiting for a change, understand that God is sovereign and you are not. While you're waiting for a change, understand that God is sovereign and you are not. Second thing I want you to notice here is that Job retracted his words and repented his sins. We really see this in verse 6. Job retracted his words and repented his sins. We have no weight, no power, and no authority when it comes to reconciling ourselves to God. The word reconcile really is this 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 picture that it's a word that we don't really use anymore. Um, you know, I've taught you this before that um, it's it's an accounting term, right? It's it's uh, like if if you reconcile your checkbook, you know, if you want it to everything to equal out to zero or, or whatever, you know, you're trying to balance your checkbook, and so when uh, th- this word reconciliation, this theological word reconciliation, has to do with the balance of our righteousness, our good deeds versus our bad deeds. Well, the reality is there's no one righteous, no, not one. So if we're trying to reconcile ourselves, it's all bad and no good, right? That, 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 that we'll never do it, I won't say it's no good, but we'll never do enough good to counterbalance the bad. But Jesus reconciles himself to us. Remember, Job is repenting the sin of not trusting God in the middle of his calamity. See, remember, Job was blameless before all of this happened, right? He's not suffering as a result of his sin, but his sin has his suffering has tempted him to sin. And so Job is now apologizing. He's, he's repenting of that sin before God. Uh, and and Again, what I would remind you of, if you're taking notes, is while you are waiting for a change, understand that God is sovereign and you are not. And take the opportunity when you're going through a calamity, when a tragedy has struck in your life, to consider what has it caused you to do? Has it caused you, has, has, has the struggle that you've been going through Calls you to do more than just question God, but in your in your questioning of God, have you been accusatory? Have you have you sinned like Job sinned, not trusting in God's sovereignty? Well, Job forty two goes on in verse seven. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, God, the Lord, said to Eliphaz the Temanite, this is one of Job's three friends, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. Verse 8, So take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. Man, God says that twice. You've not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. So if you're taking notes, the third thing I want you to, to, to notice is that God reproofed the friends and reviewed Job's faith. God reproofed or rebuked the friends of Job. Uh, They had bad theology, and God calls it out, right? But then God goes on to review or retest Job's faith. I'm going to get to that in just a second. God seeks to humble these three friends of Job in two ways. He tells them that they are theologically wrong that Job was actually the better theologian in those 35 chapters that they were arguing against each other, that Job is actually the better theologian. And and he makes them, he makes these three friends seek forgiveness from Job to seek forgiveness from God through the very one that they had reviled, that they had said was an enemy of God. They're, they're going to have to, to seek forgiveness through Job. Even though he wasn't perfect, Job was the better theologian. And so God is not allowing these guys to just go back to their, to their homes, to their closets, and, and pray a simple prayer, and, and you know, bam, it's all done with. You know, God, I'm sorry. You know, Dear Heavenly Father, God in heaven, please forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God is not satisfied with that for these three friends. He is, he is sort of 
testing them and pushing them further. They must go to Job and offer sacrifices and ask him to pray for them. Listen, this has got to be deeply humiliating for them. The very one that they had accused of being far from God must now become their priest to bring them near to God. In other words, God is seeing to it that the only way that these three friends can experience reconciliation with God is through experiencing reconciliation with Job. In other words, uh, they got to make things right with Job so that they can make things right with God. And again, it, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's through the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, ultimately, that we're reconciled. But what God is saying to these three friends is, listen, your relationship with me is important, but your relationship with Job is also important. And so I want you to, to make things right, to reconcile yourselves with Job, and then through that you will reconcile yourself with me. They must humble themselves before Job, in this case, not simply before God. But this cuts both ways. There's a second thing that God is doing here uh, before He restores the fortunes of Job. He is reviewing the repentance of Job. When the three friends come to Job seeking his intercession with God, seeking for him to pray for them, it's not just their humility that's on trial. Job is now being asked to love his enemies and to pray for those who abused him. He is being asked to bless those who cursed him and not return evil for evil. Remember back in Job 1 and 2 last week at the very beginning, we are talking about one of the reasons that God allowed this calamity to happen and one of the reasons that, that, that God considered Job and considers us is because we become and Job became the evidence to prove who God was and that Satan was wrong. And so Job is confirming, I'm sorry, God is confirming this evidence once and for all in the obedience of Job. And he's doing this before he ever restores anything to Job. Because remember, back at the very beginning, Satan said, listen, Job's only worshiping you because you blessed him. And then after they took everything away from Job, he said, well, you know, he's only doing this because he still has his health. You take his health away and, and he'll no longer be a paid worshiper, right? So now Job's got nothing and God is using Job's faith and his obedience to prove to prove that God is who He says He is and that Satan is wrong. And He's successful in doing that. And that is why God considers us. Job is still a very sick man. God has not yet reversed the misery. What is, what, what, what's the lesson here for Job? What's the lesson here for us? Could it be maybe the same as Matthew 6.14? If you forgive those who sin against you, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to give others, your Father will not forgive your sins. In other words, it is the repentance and faith that receive the forgiveness of God. But the genuineness of repentance, the authenticity of faith, the reality of your change of heart must prove itself in your willingness to forgive those who sin against you. As you're waiting for your change, is there someone that you need to forgive. If the forgiveness of God that a repentant sinner claims to have, to have received, does not flow through him to others, this claim is really a delusion, right? You, you can't claim to have received the forgiveness of God and not also take that forgiveness and forgive other people. Because if we truly love God, if we've truly received the love of God, if we've truly received the forgiveness of God, we will be overwhelmed by that to the point that it will be overflowing with it and we will forgive other people. Job is still in his sins, but God puts Job to one last test. Will he lay down the weapons of revenge and accept the terms of God's treaty and extend amnesty to those three friends the way that God has has extended grace to Job? And the answer to that question is yes. Job passes 
the test. He forgives his friends. So verse 9 reads, it ends this way, the Lord accepted Job's prayer. He passes the test. It's over. This is, this is the end. This is the culmination of the trial that started in the courtroom of heaven. This is the culmination, even though Satan has not been mentioned again since the middle of chapter 2, that this was really a conversation between Job and his friends as they're trying to figure out who God is and now God has revealed himself. This is still a culmination of that accusation that Satan made against God and that, and that Satan makes against us that, that God was just bribing us, was just bribing Job for his worship, and that God really was a faker. He wasn't who he said he was. But it has now been confirmed through Job's prayer, through Job's forgiveness, through Job's faithfulness to God. Was he perfect? No. Did he slip? Did he sin in his suffering? Yes. But in the end, Job's prosperity drove him closer to God. And in the end, Job's suffering drove him closer to God. Job 42 verse 10 goes on to say, When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all his brothers and sisters and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. And they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each one of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. They brought him silver and gold. Verse 12, So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 thousand camels, a thousand teams of oxen, and a thousand female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after that, living, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. So finally, number four, if you're taking notes, God reversed the curse and restored the blessing. God reversed the curse and restored the blessing. Job got double for his trouble. Job had gone through this calamity. He had, he had suffered uh, we might even you know, feel like he suffered senselessly and needlessly. It wasn't senseless and it wasn't needless. It was part of the sovereignty of God. But God recognized that Job had suffered. He'd suffered greatly. He'd suffered intense pain, uh, terrible loss. And God turned Job's life around. Did Job play a part? Sure. Job became a priest to his friends. Job was a theologian and a teacher to his friends. Job prayed intercessory prayer for his friends. Job was driven closer to God. When Job comes out of this, even before the, the curse is reversed and his blessings are restored, Job is a man more godly in chapter 42 than he was in chapter 1. He emerges from this completely restored. And so God reverse the curse. I want you to notice that Job never asked for his finances to be restored. He never asked that from God, but God gave it to him anyway. <clears throat> so uh, when it says, <coughs> excuse me, so when it says in, in verse 10 that the Lord restored his fortunes, uh, again, in, in the original Hebrew, that, that word, um, Restore that phrase restored his fortunes could actually be translated that the Lord turned his captivity, that the Lord turned the captivity of Job. This is a suggestive phrase uh, that the act of praying for his friends and restoring his relationship with them, in a sense, freed Job from captivity. It does not say that God turned the poverty of Job nor the health of Job. He didn't turn the friendships of Job. Rather, literally, it says that he turned the captivity of Job. A man might be poor and sick and friendless and not be a captive. And Job, in, in the middle of, of, of his suffering, 
um, as he prayed for his friends before all of his fortunes were restored, before his brothers and sisters showed up and gave him silver and gold and all of those you know, cattle came back and before he had all of these uh, uh, you know, 10 more children with his wife, <clears throat> Job was already freed from his captivity. And the reality is that we could be full of fortune and friendship and still be captive. Job humbled himself before God, and God revealed himself to Job, and he brought atonement to his friends, and he prayed for them, even while he was still in captivity, even before all the change happened. God revealed himself to Job. Job prayed for his friends, even in the midst of his struggling in his captivity. This release happened after Job's relationship with his friends was restored when he prayed for his friends. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it might have been a weak restoration, right? Um, if Job's relationship with, with his three friends remained as contentious and bitter as it was during the debate, but that has been restored. And so once that relationship was restored, once there was reconciliation of the friendship, then God restored Job's fortunes. Do you feel trapped by your circumstances? Job did. And that's, that's not um, an ungodly feeling to feel trapped by your circumstances, to feel like a captive, unable to control what's going on with your body, unable to control uh, what's going on in your family, in your finances, to feel out of control is not always an ungodly feeling. It's okay to not be okay. Job was not okay. But God loved Job too much to leave him that way, and God loves you too much to leave him that way. In the end, God changed Job's life by freeing him from captivity, from the captivity of his suffering, from the captivity of his, of his circumstances. In this life, you will, you will feel calamity and tragedy. You will suffer. Like a pot of boiling water, you will be immersed in circumstances where you would rather not find yourself. Eventually, though, things will change. God will reach in that pot of boiling water and lift you out. And your response to calamity reveals your character. I saw a quote this week that says this, That same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. I'd never seen that before until this week. The same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. It's about what you're made of, not the circumstances. Church, what are you made of? When the world begins boiling around you, will you get soft and mushy? Or when the world seems to boil around you, will it harden your resolve for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will you emerge like Job, more godly and more firm in your convictions? And will God see any reason in our response to double our trouble, to, to, to double us uh, because of our trouble. James 5.11 summarizes the book of Job this way. He says, We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. If you are waiting for change... Listen to me. God can set you free. Will you trust His sovereignty? The whole point of the book of Job is that God invites you to trust Him to reverse the curse. Friends, we all have a curse in our lives. Whether you're going through a calamity or a tragedy right now or not, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are under the curse of sin. And only through a saving faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ can that curse be reversed. God has taught us clearly that, that 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He's taught us clearly in His Word that what we earn for the sin that we do, that the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The day is going to come when whatever suffering you may be experiencing in this earth will end. The day is going to come when you will breathe your last breath. And Scripture teaches us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When we, when we breathe our last breath, we're going to stand before God. And He's going to say one of two things from us. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom. Come on into heaven. Or He's going to say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Depart from me, you sinner who never looked for a Savior. Depart from me. I never knew you. So you have the opportunity to trust God to reverse the curse. You have the opportunity to trust God and become a child of God, a child of the kingdom. And the Bible is very clear. It's, it's very simple what God expects. He says if you, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you, if you believe in your heart that Jesus lived and died and rose again and you confess, you, you say with your mouth, this is what I'm trusting in. I'm trusting in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says you will be saved. So I invite you this morning. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Like Job, trust God. Trust His sovereignty. In the midst of the circumstances, say what Job said in chapter 19, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know the one who can buy me back from all the struggles that I have, that can, that can rescue me from this captivity, that can set me free from my sins. I know that Jesus, my Redeemer, lives, and I trust in Him. I invite you to do that this morning. I invite you to come next week and join us again as we wrap up this series, Worst Year Ever. Next week will be the last week of it. We'd love to see you in person at the church at Lake Forest. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. God, I pray for those watching this morning that we all would understand that our Redeemer lives. And God, I pray for the person this morning that's watching that, that feels stuck, that feels like they just can't get free of what's holding them back. God, I pray that they would accept your invitation to trust in your sovereignty, to trust in your Son, to trust Jesus to set them free. God, to set them free from their sins, to set them free from their circumstances. And God, like Job, we believe that our Redeemer lives. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, into this world to live a perfect life, to become the perfect sacrifice to set us free from our sins. Thank you for showing us amazing grace. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Have a great week. I'll see you next week.